we are starting the unit on civil liberties. Um, so it depends on what book you have, on what chapter this is, but just find the chapter on civil liberties. If you have an essentials version, then the civil liberties and civil rights chapter are probably together. But we'll divide these into two weeks, civil liberties this week and civil rights next week. And then these um, objectives are broken into three parts for uh, this week. Hmm. Part one is going to be defining what we mean by civil liberties and civil rights, and then talk about where do we get these civil liberties, where do we find these in American politics. Um, and then we're going to talk about this doctrine of incorporation, which you will know to, you'll come to know and possibly, if not love, uh, at least understand. Um, and this is basically applying the Bill of Rights to the states. Part two, we'll talk about specifically the First and Second Amendments. And then part three, we'll look at the rights of the accused, which is the Fourth through the Eighth Amendment, and then the right to privacy. So this is um, a big chapter, um, a lot of concepts that we'll go through, and there's going to be a lot of court cases that you're going to need to be aware of. So keep note of those. If I have them on the overhead slides or the PowerPoints, and you should make a note to understand at least what the ruling was and why it's significant. All right, well, let's just start by differentiating between civil liberties and civil rights. A lot of times these terms are used interchangeably, but they don't mean the same thing. And so civil liberties are, um, this is where the government should rarely intrude upon the free choice of individuals. So this is the things that um, are in the Bill of Rights. So think of specific individual rights that we have where the government shouldn't intrude upon our freedom. So they shouldn't intrude upon our freedom of speech, freedom uh, to practice a religion, uh, fair trials, things of that nature. So this is really restraints on the government or what the government should not do. And these are rights that are constitutionally protected, things like due process. So civil liberties, you, you realize those things or you enjoy the civil liberties when the government is refrained from infringing upon those rights. Civil rights, on the other hand, are those types of rights where the government must act in order to ensure that all citizens are treated fairly and that opportunities are available to all. So the obligation is the government needs to take positive action. So it's what the government must do to provide for equal protection or equal access. So think of the civil rights movement. So to differentiate between these two, think of civil liberties as those things that you enjoy when the government refrains from intruding upon your life. Freedom from search and seizure, for example. Um, whereas civil rights is something that the government has to do proactively in order to ensure that you have equal rights regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, that sort of thing. So think of the Civil Rights Movement or the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. Those are positive acts of government that they are using in order to ensure that you have, we all have the same freedoms. Okay, so it's got to be clear on the difference between civil liberties and civil rights. The question becomes, are these personal liberties, are, they, are these freedoms guaranteed? And generally, we like to say they are, but they're not absolute. So for example, there are some exceptions to the guarantees that we find in the Bill of Rights, for example. So keep in mind that the freedom of expression is not unlimited. So one example we'll talk about when it comes to freedom of speech, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And this simply means that your freedom of speech ends when it endangers other people's freedoms. So there's always going to be a conflict between people's freedoms. And society has to weigh whether the individual rights are more important than the needs of the society as a collective. And there's one court case where this is really played out and it might be familiar to you. There was a court case in 1966, the title of which is Shepard v. Maxwell. And in this particular case, the defendant, Mr. Maxwell, is on trial for second degree murder for the bludgeoning death of his pregnant wife. And so he is uh, found guilty, but he appeals his case on the grounds that he believes he had an unfair trial. He maintained his innocence, of course, but he alleged that the trial judge failed to protect him from the massive, widespread, and prejudicial publicity that it 
that accompanied his trial. Back in the 1960s, um, what had occurred at his trial in Ohio was that the press was seated right behind the prosecution. The prosecution was feeding information to the press, and then the press would print that particular information in the paper where the jury could read that. So he argued that he was getting an unfair trial, and this was really a conflict between the First Amendment freedom of the press and his uh, personal freedoms or his liberties to have a fair trial that you find in the Sixth Amendment. So you have certain freedom in conflict with one another. And so if you have the case of freedom of the press versus the right to a fair trial, the court ruled that he indeed had an unfair trial. The freedom of the press, the idea that this collective need to know things can't infringe upon an individual's right to a fair trial. Okay. So the court ruled uh, in an eight to one decision that Shepard did not receive a fair trial. And they noted that although freedom of expression should be given great latitude, the court held that it must not be so broad as to divert the trial away from its primary purpose, and that's to ensure a fair trial. So he was granted a new trial, um, but was found guilty and, and served a, a smaller uh, sentence nonetheless. We know this as the fugitive case. There was a TV show back in the 60s and 70s. It was originally in black and white, um, starring David Jansen, and then colored, uh, colored uh, film uh, later on in the series. And I used to watch that when I was a child. And, and the man, Mr. Shepard, was always in search of the one-armed man who he claimed killed his wife. And of course, they made that into a movie called The Fugitive with Harrison Ford. And you probably can see that pretty regularly on TV. It's on TNT a lot or TBS. Um, or you can stream it on Netflix. But that is the basis of the court case of Maxwell v. Shepard. All right, so but the, the point I'm trying to make is that, yes, civil liberties tend to be guaranteed, but they're not absolute. So when any of the Bill of Rights, for example, are in conflict with one another, the courts are going to probably side on the freedom of the individual, so to make sure he gets a free trial, for example. All right. Well, are the Bill of Rights even necessary? You might imagine that Alexander Hamilton thought that they weren't, and he suggested that we don't need to have these additional civil liberties where we have a government that has delegated or enumerated powers. Um, and he also argues there's already restrictions on government within the Constitution. And I'll show you these in a minute. These are called the Bills of Attainder, the Ex Post Facto, and the Habeas Corpus. And so those are provided within the Constitution, so there's no real need for the Bill of Rights. We know that the Anti-Federalists, this was one of the compromise that they would agree to the Constitution as long as we had a Bill of Rights. And they won out, of course. And we know that the federal government is hardly held to lots of its delegated powers. So we have to think about how important is the written word. Often our Constitution has written down these ideals that we don't really respect or haven't respected throughout the nation's history. After all, the Constitution said all men are created equal, but we know that that wasn't the case up until and even into the 20th century. So the power of the written word is that it's, it is seen and that eventually we will become bound by a document and respect rights not respected in our nation's beginning. So many people suggest that the Bill of Rights is necessary and it has been an important element in ensuring our civil liberties. So let me just show you, um, well before I do that, the, the, the way the Bill of Rights has been applied is called the Doctrine of Incorporation. And this is where the 14th Amendment is important. So let's think about the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment as part of the Bill of Rights, for example, begins with the words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Let me repeat that. The First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion. So the first 100 years of our country, the Supreme Court read the Bill of Rights literally and limited this civil liberty to the acts of Congress. And so they limited the First Amendment to what Congress can do. Okay. But by the time the 14th Amendment rolls around in 1868, the 14th Amendment is a Civil War uh, Amendment. It's passed right after the Civil War. It begins to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. 
So the 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So the first 100 years, the Supreme Court ruled in terms of the Bill of Rights, literally saying Congress could not infringe upon these rights. It said nothing about what states could do. So for the first 100 years of our nation, states are passing laws left and right that really violate civil liberties. It's the 14th Amendment after the Civil War that starts to apply the Bill of Rights to the states through the 14th Amendment. So this is referred to as the doctrine of incorporation. And how it's phrased is the First Amendment applied to the states through the 14th Amendment says no states shall infringe upon people's right to freedom of religion, for example. So the phraseology is the First Amendment is applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. Okay, And so keep that phraseology in mind. We'll revisit this often over the next couple of lectures. And this really gets to the heart of the idea that we really have, in essence, dual citizenship. We're citizens of the federal government, the United States, but we're also citizens of the state, in our case, the state of Texas. And so the Bill of Rights prior to the 14th Amendment really was a conflict between the Bill of Rights and the state. Okay, And this conflict raises the concept of dual citizenship. You're a citizen of both the federal and the state government. And the, course, the court case where this is first played out is a court case called Barron v. Baltimore. And I don't go into the, the specifics of this case other than to say that Mr. Barron was a businessman who had his business on the harbor and the city of Baltimore wanted to make some city improvements along the harbor but it damaged his business and he argued that they're taking away his property without compensation in violation of the Fifth Amendment. Well, the court ruled in favor of, of Baltimore, finding that the Supreme Court had no jurisdiction in the case because the Fifth Amendment only applies to the federal government and not states. So this Barron v. Baltimore case is back in the 1830s. So prior to the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court really looked at the fact that the Bill of Rights, in this case the Fifth Amendment, eminent domain part, didn't apply to the states because the Bill of Rights only applied, the Fifth Amendment in this case, only applied to the federal government. It's only through the 14th Amendment in 1868 and thereafter that the Bill of Rights begins to be applied to the states through the 14th Amendment by the courts. Okay, So this dual citizenship idea that was established by the Baring case really is solved by the 14th Amendment. And so here you have the picture of how before the 14th Amendment the Bill of Rights is only reigning in Congress, the courts, and the President, and state governments are really kind of, you know, thumbing their nose at the Bill of Rights. It's with the 14th Amendment that both the federal and state government power is reined in. So the Bill of Rights applies both to the federal government and to the state government. Okay, so that is the concept of the doctrine of incorporation. The Bill of Rights is incorporated into the states through the 14th Amendment, thereby solving the problem of this dual citizenship that the Barron case established where the court ruled at that time that the states aren't bound by the Fifth Amendment or any other amendment. Okay, all right. Um, keep in mind that all of the Bill of Rights weren't incorporated into the states all at the same time, and that's why we have what is called selective incorporation. The courts didn't just go through each one of the Bill of Rights, each one of those amendments, and make the states start complying. A court case had to be brought before the Supreme Court, and they selectively addressed each issue of the Bill of Rights and how it would be applied to the states. And I'll show you that here in a minute. All right, here are some rights, some civil liberties that are in the original Constitution that I talked about. And these are some of the things that you'll find right in the Constitution that falls under the category of civil liberties. So Article 1, Section 9 guarantees habeas corpus. All right, well, what is habeas corpus? Basically, this means that the government is required 
to um, tell you what you're being held for. You can't be held in jail indefinitely. So we can't suspend habeas corpus. Um, although it has been done, President Lincoln did it during the Civil War. Um, it has been found to be unconstitutional. So if you're arrested at some point, you have to be told why you're being held. All right. Article 1, Section 9 says that we are going to prohibit bills of attainder. That means that you can't find someone guilty of a crime without a trial. A bill of attainder means that you are um, throwing someone in jail without giving them a trial, and we don't allow that. So even though we don't have the Sixth Amendment in the Constitution that guarantees you a fair trial, the Constitution says you can't be put in jail without a trial. Article 1, Section 9 also says that we're not going to have any ex post facto laws. Okay. That means that laws um, that declare an action to, to be illegal after it has been committed. What that means is that you can't commit some act today that is not illegal, and if tomorrow the state of Texas declares that action to be illegal, they can't go back and arrest you after the fact. Okay. So, um, so, for example, if you're traveling down San Houston Boulevard and there's not a stop sign at an intersection, but tomorrow there is, they can't go back and, and, and arrest you for running that stop sign because it wasn't there when you actually went through that intersection. The same way, another example would be um, in terms of death penalty cases. If you're aware of the Charles Manson case in California, he, him and his cohorts killed a, a number of people back in the 60s. He has served a life sentence in California since then. He can never be put to death, even though California now has a death penalty, because at the time there wasn't the death penalty uh, as, a, as a potential um, uh, penalty for that particular crime. So you can't go back in time to arrest somebody or find someone guilty of an act if it wasn't illegal at the time. All right, there's some additional elements that we prohibit in terms of civil liberties. Um, we're not going to have nobility in our country, for example. You're guaranteed a trial by jury in the state where the crime was committed. Um, and then Article 3 also talks about um, treason is defined and limited to the life of the person convicted, that your heirs can't be um, found guilty of treason. Um, just because you're their heir. All right, so those are some civil liberties that are found in the Constitution. All right, here are the civil liberties that we then find in the Bill of Rights. And so the First Amendment covers the whole concept of expression and that Congress shall make no law, okay? Article two, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. Article, uh, Amendment three, no soldier shall be quartered. Our, uh, amendment number four, no warrant shall issue. Okay, number five, no person shall be held for a crime unless they go through the grand jury process. Uh, amendment number eight talks about excessive bail shall not be required, nor cruel and unusual punishment. So all these no's and nots and nor's, that's your clue that civil liberties are only realized when government is not doing something to you. Okay, so um, civil liberties requires that the government refrain from some sort of action. All right. Well, we know that all those different rights become incorporated into the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment, as I explained before. But it was selectively done, and you can see through time different elements of the different amendments are selectively addressed. So, for example, an eminent domain, which is part of the Fifth Amendment, is addressed in 1897 through this particular case. In 1925, this amendment, the First Amendment, just the part that dealt with speech is incorporated into the states through this case called Gitlow v. New York. Okay. Freedom of press in 1931, freedom of exercise of religion, in 1934, and other additional parts of the First Amendment in 37 and 39, another part of the religious part, uh, religion part of the First Amendment in 1947 in the Everson case, freedom from unnecessary search and seizure as part of the Fourth Amendment is not incorporated until 1949, and then. Um, 
the case that gave us what's called the exclusionary rule, which we'll talk about, is incorporated in 1961 with the Matt v. Ohio case. Cruel and unusual punishment, the right to counsel, is in the 1963 case with the Gideon. Uh, the Fifth Amendment, the, the right to remain silent, this should be familiar to you, the Miranda case in 1966. Your right against double jeopardy is applied to the states uh, in 1969. And right up to 2010, the right to bear arms in the Second Amendment is incorporated to the states in the McDonald case. So again, the doctrine of incorporation is applying the Bill of Rights to the states through the 14th Amendment. Originally, this was selective incorporation where the provisions, the different provisions of the Bill of Rights were to be considered one by one and selectively applied. And striking down state laws that infringed upon freedom of expression. And this is eventually getting to all the Bill of Rights. So they start with the freedom of expression and eventually all the different types of rights that are found in the Bill of Rights are eventually incorporated to the states. Okay. Alright, we're going to take a break there. but kind of think about the importance of the 14th Amendment. That until the 14th Amendment comes along, right after the Civil War, the Supreme Court doesn't um, apply the Bill of Rights to state government. The Bill of Rights is only applied to acts of Congress and the federal government. So it's not until after the Civil War does all those things that we take for granted today in terms of the Bill of Rights. It's only after the Civil War that the Supreme Court is making states and state government abide by those things that we find in the Bill of Rights. All right, part two is coming up next.